it's the first uh, seminar of uh, this year, so um, we're delighted to uh, to to be back, and uh, we're particularly excited tonight to uh, welcome uh, Joel Kruger and uh, also his uh, his colleagues and co-authors and collaborators, Lucy Osler and uh, Tom Roberts. Um, I think uh, I understand Joel and Tom are at the University of Exeter and uh, Lucy's at, based at Cardiff University, um, but they will be presenting tonight a recent work. I think it's as of yet uh, not published, pre-publication, pre so we'll get a first uh, glance at uh, their work on uh, loneliness and absence in psychopathology. <laughs> Um, really uh, important themes, um, uh, I think we can all agree, um, in our uh, current uh, world. So uh, I won't uh, say much more. Um, uh, Professor Joel Kruger is, uh, um, is, uh, has a very broad range of uh, philosophical interests. We're quite uh, honoured and pleased that he uh, includes psychopathology as one of those, um, alongside uh, thinking about philosophy of, of mind um, and uh, uh, 4E uh, cognition um, and uh, a diversity of other other subjects as well. So that he's got a really interesting um, set of of uh, papers and outputs that uh, I recommend you go and have a look at if you don't know his work. But um, we'll hear from him ourselves, and uh, as usual, we'll have uh, 45 minutes of uh, of Joel speaking with us, and then we'll have a 45 minutes of discussion, which. Uh, uh, you're all very welcome to get involved with. We're all online tonight, so it makes it a bit easier. And uh, uh, yeah, keep keep notes and keep questions. And uh, we'll look forward to, to grilling Joel and uh, his his thank colleagues you. after after we've heard the presentation. So thank you, Joel. Over to you. Great, thank you. Yes, I look forward to the grilling, and I think with my colleagues is the key bit. They will be here, thankfully, to uh, distribute some of the the grilling experience. So thanks so much for that delightful and really uh, lovely introduction, uh, Chloe. I'm really, really honored to be here. Uh, I will I will take it upon myself to speak for both Tom and Lucy and say that we're all delighted and honored to be here with you and, and to share some work uh, that we've been doing lately on loneliness and absence in psychopathology. So there's Lucy and Tom. Uh, you'll see their faces a little bit later. Uh, they have been, uh, we've been collaborating on this work, and so I want to make sure that they are here and get credit for this as well. Okay, uh, so here's uh, what I want to do today in the discussion for this evening. Uh, summarize the analysis of loneliness that uh, Tom and I defended in a 20, 2021 article, Loneliness and the Emotional Experience of Absence. And then suggest some ways this analysis might help us understand certain cases in phenomenological psychopathology. So that's broadly speaking the agenda for the discussion. And the main idea that we put forward in this paper is that despite recent interest in both social and emotional disturbances within different forms of psychopathology, so in other words, a turn to more situated, relational, embodied, affective, whatever additional adjectives you want to pile on, um, approaches to psychopathology, loneliness remains under-theorized. And we think this matters. This is a matter not just of uh, philosophical or phenomenological dispute, but it has some practical significance. And this is because understanding the character of these disturbances, which are often described in terms of social withdrawal, alienation, effective, effective flattening, feelings of disconnectedness, social anxiety, etc. These descriptions are not in and of themselves sufficient to understand the structure and character of loneliness, which is important, and how it shapes some of the self-world alterations that are distinctive of different forms of psychopathology. So with the, the main argument we put forward in this piece is that uh, attention to the distinctive profiles and places of loneliness within various psychopathologies can therefore provide a richer map of the, the terrain, give us a richer, more phenomenologically textured underst understanding of the lived experience of different forms of psychopathology. And as I said, it also has practical import, or so we think, insofar as it potentially impacts diagnostic and remedial strategies. So in this paper, we uh, focus on three case studies, depression, anorexia, nervosa, and uh, autism. And tonight, just given time constraints, I'm not going to talk much about depression. I'm going to focus mainly on the latter two. So we'll get to that in a little bit. So here's the, uh, the, the menu for this evening. I'm going to talk a bit about loneliness and absence, kind of reconstruct the argument in the paper that Tom and I wrote a couple of years ago, turn to uh, a new idea that we've been incorporating on loneliness and recognition or absence of recognition, 
uh, then turn to three case studies, but actually two, and then end with some very general final thoughts, which consist of one slide, and then discussion. Okay, so loneliness and absence. So a couple of years ago, Tom and I wrote a paper. Uh, also, even though Lucy's name isn't on this, she was very much involved in conversations and helping her thinking about this. And so she was involved already from the very beginning as well, uh, called Loneliness and the Emotional Experience of Absence. Hi. And the aim Actually, of the right. Do you want to listen on my phone? was to give a conceptual analysis of the concept of loneliness that we thought would help unpack the phenomenology of loneliness. And we thought the import of this project was to uh, accomplish a number of things, such as distinguish loneliness from solitude, understand why loneliness is so subjectively awful, and other things of that sort. And the core claim we put forward in this project, in this paper, is that the experience of loneliness is fundamentally an emotional experience of absence. And this emotional experience of absence has a complex structure, which is to say both a world-directed and a subject directed or a self-directed uh, aspect. We motivated this argument by observing first experiences of absence are very common in everyday life. And this is something that uh, Tom has worked extensively on in, in uh, his work. Think about you know, homesickness, grief, unrequited love, envy, nostalgia, pretty comprehensive list we can compile. And all of these, we argued, are emotions with an intentional object to use fancy philosophy speak, that is some kind of absence. All of them involve some sort of experiential encounter with absence in some particular way. But loneliness, we argue, is unique in that its phenomenological core, it's constitutively this felt encounter with a particular kind of absence. Now, there's a lot we could say about that, and maybe that's an excessively strong claim when it comes to thinking about loneliness. But for our purposes, we have to get into those debates so much as uh, consider what is more relevant today. And the question is, what kind of absence are we encountering with loneliness? What does it mean to say that loneliness is an experiential encounter with absence? What we argued in the paper is that to be lonely is to experience various social goods, so things like companionship, moral support, physical contact, affection, sympathy, trust, romance, friendship, etc. To experience these things as, as both absent and is somehow out of reach or unattainable. And this way of thinking about uh, loneliness as an encounter of absence of social goods reveals, we think, its two-part psychological structure. Loneliness consists of both a directedness, a kind of world directedness towards some desired social good that's absent, along with a felt awareness that these goods are out of reach for us. That somehow we can't attain them or access them which gives rise to its distressing character, which makes loneliness so subjectively awful. And one of the reasons why this is such an awful experience, that loneliness has this, this character, this distressing character, we argued, is that these social goods are things we feel we need to establish and maintain our most valued human, human relationships, to develop our identity, our sense of self through relationships with other people, and just to give meaning to the projects and values that organize our lives. So without access to these, these goods, we're really missing out on goods that we argue are essential to feeling that we're living a well-lived life. And the scope and scale of these felt absences are what make loneliness so painful. So today, and this is something that's gonna resurface this theme a little bit later, in this way, we might think of experiences of absence as closely tied to experiences of access or lack thereof. So it's not just in loneliness that these goods are missing from an individual's life, the way, say, one might realize that a, a slice of cake that we thought was in the refrigerator at work now seems to have mysteriously disappeared. I mean, we can, in fact, replace that slice of cake. We can probably go find something else that would satisfy that desire we have for the, the slice of cake. This, in the case of loneliness, these absent goods are, for whatever reason, qualities or things that cannot be uh, readily achieved or brought about. They're absent and adding to our distress, they're deeply inaccessible. So this, this connects to another theme that's going to be important for some of the things that we were, want to talk about in the paper today. Uh, this emotional experience of absence within loneliness and its connection with access or lack thereof impacts, we think, our sense of agency. So again, we can probably uh, replace, uh, replace the, the slice of cake, but it may be the case or at least feel like we're powerless to alleviate our loneliness. And we might even know what would help. We might, for example, know that if we 
Uh, we're able to have a romantic partner, maybe have a deceased parent back in our lives, maybe find the ways to develop richer, more authentic friendships, etc. These things would help alleviate uh, this loneliness in the sense that uh, these social goods are inaccessible to us. But again, when lonely, or so we argue, we're we feel unable to realize the conditions that would help us satisfy these social goods. So this is significant, we suggested, in that it highlights that the emotional experience of loneliness isn't just about the world and others. Again, it has a kind of self-directed or a subject-facing element as well. It's fundamentally tied to our sense of agency, our sense of what we can or cannot do, as well as our self-conception and our self-regard. Now, just to, to clarify, in the discussion today and in this paper that the three of us are working on, uh, the, the, the connection between loneliness and diminished self-conception and self-regard is interesting, but we're more interested, again, in the former, the way that um, uh, experience of loneliness uh, and the feeling of inaccessibility that's part of its structure, we think, impacts and shapes our sense of agency, diminishes our sense of agency. That's, again, going to be a theme that resurfaces throughout the talk today. So we are philosophers, we like to define our terms. What do we mean by agency in this context? Well, nothing fancy. Just by agency, we just mean the feeling of being able to do things, as well as the feeling that certain possibilities are available to us, certain possibilities are within the scope of things that we can potentially do. I think agency is relevant here because it has, like loneliness, both an objective and a subjective side. And this is important for the analysis we want to give in of loneliness and psychopathology. So on one hand, it may be objectively true that I can do things like speak to a stranger at a party, walk down an unlit street at night, refuse to answer a police officer's questions, uh, kind of push back against a, a terse border guard at passport control, something like that. That may be an arena in which I, objectively speaking, can exercise my agency, but I nevertheless may feel, subjectively feel, a lack of agency in these contexts, which means that these objective possibilities are no longer experienced as salient possibilities for me. And this lack of agency, this feeling of a kind of diminished agency is something that can uh, be shaped by many different factors. So shyness, social anxiety, illness, a lack of self-confidence, maybe culture shock, disability, the pressure of power structures or normative expectations that govern that context, et cetera. So there are lots of complicated re reasons why we think it's important to distinguish between the objective dimension of agency and the subjective or felt dimension. And just to flag uh, my, my co-authors here, um, Tom and Lucy have a really cool paper uh, called Social Doubt uh, that's forthcoming where they explore some of these issues in the context of uh, social interaction. So, okay, so that's a little bit of background uh, on kind of the view that Tom and I put forward in the paper, what some of the, the important themes of this view are, we think, for the discussion uh, today. Now I want to link it to a new idea, uh, this idea of recognition and non-recognition. We think this is an, another concept, not just something that will help the discussion, not just in terms of piling up yet more concepts, but actually can impact, uh, sorry, un help us unpack some additional dimensions of the experience of loneliness, specifically as it develops and is articulated in the context of psychopathology. So loneliness and non-recognition. So this is our colleague, uh, Sarah Lucas. Um, uh, Sarah is in the politics department, but she's, she's actually a philosopher. I think we get to claim her. Um, she has written this really brilliant uh, recent piece that I strongly encourage you all to read called Loneliness, Recognition, and uh, sorry, Loneliness and Appearance for a Concept of Ontological Agency. And uh, for Lucas, loneliness is fundamentally tied to agency, and the absence of agency is, in fact, the condition of loneliness. She argues that we experience loneliness because we somehow feel that we're not recognized by others, somehow not seen. Now, she considers this explicitly in the context of political agency and action, and the way that different power structures and political structures can be put in place to uh, control individuals by keeping them in a kind of perpetual state of disconnection and loneliness by giving them a persistent feeling that they're not being seen or recognized by the collective and that's that's really interesting and i don't want to um uh, i have nothing to say about that unfortunately it's a really rich paper and that's why i encourage you to read it but i think what we're interested in taking from this idea of recognition is a sense that this way of thinking about loneliness is connected to a sense that we're not 
fully present to the world as an arena of possible action. And then the key insight in Sarah's paper is that this feeling of not being fully present to the world as an arena of possible action isn't necessarily just because of some lack on the side of the subject, on our side. It can in fact be because the world is set up explicitly to limit or deny possibilities for recognition and the kind of reciprocity or interactive engagements, a connection with others that are made possible within recognition. So that's the key insight we take from this, this idea of recognition or the, of recognition that uh, Sarah's working with. So here's how she puts this. Uh, she says an agency then is not the capacity to align action and intention. It is rather the constant capacity to appear as a unique self in the world. And so just to reiterate what I've said, I think Lucas really helpfully highlights some ways that both ontological and political registers of agency and recognition or its absence shape the experience of loneliness. Again, we're gonna focus on, a, take a slightly different perspective on this. And so just to kind of make this a little more concrete, let me give you an example. Um, I should say, by the way, so I'm not sure what this says about my search algorithm, but uh, the first images that came up when I searched for, did a Google image search for sad party, were these four images of bearded dudes sitting there with party hats looking very sad. So I think Google knows, has I think a scary amount of information about who, who's on the other end, who's doing the searching. But so that's why I have to explain these images. Okay, so just a simple example to kind of merely make this point explicit between recognition and a sense of diminished agency. So just imagine you started a new job uh, in a new city and a colleague invites you to her place for a party. You're excited, you wanna meet people, uh, you enthusiastically say yes and you go. And when you arrive, you walk in, you don't know anybody, uh, immediately your new colleague and other people there make it very apparent that they're not especially interested in getting to know you. Maybe they give you a cursory glance, kind of make very kind of clips uh, in different small talk, and then they essentially turn back and resume the conversation, leaving you to stand there awkwardly on your own. So what happens uh, in this situation? Well, you feel a pervasive lack of recognition in that context. And that lack of recognition is going to impact you at the level of your bodily agency. It's not necessarily something anyone has said, it's just more a kind of atmosphere that makes it clear you are not especially welcome in that context. You are not recognized as someone who is invited to be a participatory member of that particular context. And that experience, that pervasive lack of recognition impacts your sense of bodily agency. You might suddenly feel very awkward. It's not sure what to do with yourself bodily. Maybe you wander over to the window, hold a drink awkwardly, look at the books on a shelf, kind of scan the room, and then begin to plot how you can most uh, effectively and unobtrusively make your escape. That's a very obviously a very kind of mild example. What we're talking about, I think, are more significant and meaningful examples of non-recognition and diminished bodily agency that we'll get to in a little bit. But just to kind of drive this point home, the, the idea here is not just that the others aren't talking to you. This non-recognition is something that can be expressed in a non-verbal manner as well, kind of general bodily comportment and a kind of atmosphere that's established by the other's indifference in that space. So James Jardin has a really nice quote, I think, that captures this idea of non-recognition as something that is not necessarily confined to speech acts, but it's more pre-linguistic and embodied, it says that it is often through non-linguistic forms of bodily expressivity as enhancing or entirely replacing speech actions that others impress upon us our visibility or invisibility in a social sense, since social statuses of this kind can be conveyed without any linguistic communication being necessary. So again, it's a kind of non-recognition that is somehow pre-linguistic or it's extra-linguistic, it's embodied, it's in the atmosphere, in the space. And that's going to be important uh, for uh, what we're gonna talk about in a moment. So let me just kind of sum up now, a little bit of a halftime recap since I've thrown around a fair bit of concepts and ideas uh, before then now turning to some concrete case studies to hopefully make this a bit clearer. So the idea is that uh, we suggest is that is an emotional experience of absence Loneliness isn't just about the world and what's missing from it. Again, it has a self-directed aspect too. Loneliness can disrupt our fundamental sense of being in the world in a very deep and pervasive way, including our sense of spatial orientation, bodily movement, possibilities for action, expression, connection, a diminished sense of agency, in other words. 
And we think this concept of recognition is important here. It's something that helpfully bridges what we're calling the self and world directed aspects of loneliness, it's kind of a linking concept. This is because this lack of recognition involves feeling absences of interactive possibilities and collaborative forms of understanding that social goods afford, reciprocity. These are things in the world, but also possibilities for us that are opened up or illuminated by feeling recognition. And so again, in loneliness, possibilities for reciprocity, which are revealed in the space of recognition are experientially uh, present via their absence. That's the basic idea. And that's why we talk about loneliness and absence in this context. Okay. So maybe that all still seemed a little bit abstract. Not quite sure how these different pieces fit together. Let's, let's see if we can make this um, a bit clearer now by uh, providing three case studies. And as I said, I'm actually gonna talk mainly about two case studies since, uh, since I don't have time to work through all three. So just the basic idea in now applying our analysis this way is again, just to reiterate things I said at the beginning, within phenomenological uh, psychopathology, there's been an increased attention paid to social, emotional, and relational aspects of mental disorders. So I kind of this move away from thinking of mental disorders as things that are just inside the individual, and thinking rather in more situated, embodied, and relational terms, uh, how individuals uh, inhabit a world that they share with others and the kind of relationships and spaces that often play a role in shaping and sustaining the developmental trajectory of different disorders. In other words, there's been this kind of fo focus on how individuals experience their bodies, inhabit space, and share actions and emotions with others. Yet despite this relational and uh, emphasis and this focus on social and emotional aspects uh, within psychopathology. Loneliness has not been theorized in this context as a discrete category of experience. So for example, um, two recent really wonderful books kind of giving an overview of the field, both the Oxford Handbook of Philosophy and Psychiatry, as well as the Oxford Handbook of Phenomenological Psychopathology. Neither of them have, any, have an entry on loneliness. Neither of them in fact say anything about loneliness apart I think it's in the Oxford Handbook of Phenomenological Psychopathology. I think Matthew Ratcliffe's article is the one reference to loneliness that's found, and he's actually quoting um, uh, quoting someone else, uh, a Dutch psychiatrist whose name completely is escaping me. I have a couple of his books on the bookshelf back there somewhere who argues that loneliness is the nucleus of psychopathology. Now, again, so he's just quoting someone else. That's the only place that loneliness shows up. And so we think more attention needs to be Hey, Vandenberg, there we go, belatedly remembered that, Vandenberg. And so why is that? Why hasn't loneliness been paid attention to in this context, investigated? Well, I think one reason for this neglect, we think, is probably that loneliness has been subsumed or kind of a thought to have been swallowed up or adequately captured by more general discussions of things like social withdrawal, social impairments, experiences of alienation, just other more general disruptions of an individual's ability to connect with others and negotiate the social world. Somehow loneliness is thought to be kind of folded into this package of social disruptions uh, that have received more explicit attention in recent phenomenological psychopathology. I think what we want to argue and kind of push back against this is say, well, actually, there's a reason why in loneliness as a discrete category of experience, and that's not to say that loneliness shows up as a discrete category of experience. I think phenomenologically loneliness can be very much integrated with some of the other things that I just was talking about. But loneliness itself deserves more focused attention. I think there are a number of reasons why. It potentially provides a richer map of the phenomenological terrain of self-world disturbances. So we're just you know, learning new things about the lived experience, this bringing new texture to these descriptions by acknowledging that loneliness is part of the experience. I think focusing on loneliness, as we're going to see in a few minutes, hopefully, potentially highlights some underexplored factors that shape the development and character of different forms of psychopathology. And I think a, lonely, a focus on loneliness can foreground both the pervasiveness of loneliness that often kind of runs through different psychopathologies, but also highlighting some, dis, some differences, the way that loneliness as an experience shows up differently in, for example, anorexia nervosa or depression or other forms of psychopathology. And we think ultimately this may impact diagnostic and remedial strategies. So again, it may have practical significance in terms of how we think about intervention strategies. And I have to say at the outset, we're not gonna really say anything about this, unfortunately. Um, this is the bit where hopefully maybe some of you have suggestions about uh, how this analysis might in fact impact diagnostic and remedial strategies. 
Okay, so just to kind of flag uh, what we talk about in the paper, we do, as I said, talk about loneliness and depression. And we argue that loneliness may be a core or even a constitutive element of the experiential texture of what it is to be depressed. And we have some reasons why we think that's so. But we're just gonna set that aside because in some ways, I think loneliness in the context of both anorexia nervosa and autism might be slightly more unexpected. And so we think that might be more philosophically interesting to focus on that uh, tonight. Okay, so let, let me turn to uh, anorexia. So anorexia nervosa is a complex uh, eating disorder uh, characterized by self-starvation. And loneliness is not typically considered a core diagnostic feature of anorexia. Uh, but many anorectics, in fact, do report being lonely. They report being stigmatized. That's going to be important in a minute. It's stereotyped, cut off from communities who can understand and support them. In other words, they talk very openly and very movingly about lacking access to social resources, relationships, and forms of recognition that others take for granted. So we think foregrounding loneliness within the experience, the complex experience of anorexia nervosa can provide a richer picture beyond the sort of desire for thinness caricatures that often dominate discussions of anorexia in media, popular culture, and even some of the medical and phenomenological literature. So just a little more context, uh, uh, the American Psychiatric Association classifies anorexia nervosa as self-starvation that leads to dramatic weight loss. Current uh, diagnostic criteria, someone can only be diagnosed uh, with anorexia nervosa when their self-starvation leads to significantly low body weight. Now this is problematic as a number of people have argued for several reasons, this characterization. First, someone might be a practicing anorectic before they meet the, the weight loss threshold and thus fail to satisfy diagnostic criteria. I think this is especially problematic because um, anorexia nervosa is typically characterized in relation to white aesthetics regarding body weight, shape, and size. So not attuned to cultural variations of these, these features. And secondly, and this is something that a number of phenomenologists have recently argued, including Lucy in a 2021 paper, this desire for thinness narrative, which is often how, it's, how uh, anorexia is characterized in literature, that people who are practicing disordered uh, eating just want to be thin, this desire for thinness narrative oversimplifies what in fact are often very complex and interrelated relational and interpersonal dimensions of anorexia nervosa. And these are some of the things we're gonna focus on in a minute in the context of loneliness. Now, to be clear, talking about loneliness in this context doesn't solve all of these worries. I think the reason that we mention them today is that just looking at some of these problems that these overly, over, overly simplistic narratives does reinforce the need to adopt phenomenologically richer multi-dimensional approaches to anorexia nervosa that move beyond an exclusively individualistic perspective, which this desire for thinness really is. It kind of places the onus on the individual. They want to be thin, hence that's the source of their disordered eating. Now, one way to think about the complexity or maybe get a better grip and a more sensitive picture of the complexity uh, of anorexia is that it, uh, anorexia nervosa can play different roles in people's lives. For some people, disordered eating is a way to achieve control, self-reliance, uh, can be a means to uh, uh, find a sense of achievement and purpose of setting objectives, tangible outputs and objectives in terms of controlling one's intake of food. Other, uh, others explicitly state that uh, anorexia helps them cope with periods of loneliness, such as the end of a relationship. So things that, again, have nothing to do with some overarching desire to be thin. So just a representative quote, one individual says that her, uh, her anorexia is always there for me to stop feeling alone. She's very explicit about that. Individuals might retreat into anorexia as a response to loneliness. This is because many of them say it can provide a kind of sense of purpose, comfort, predictability, uh, familiarity as an effect, or perhaps an effective way of distracting from other kinds of emotional or bodily pain. So that's one of Lucy's arguments in this, uh, in her recent paper. And this familiarity is kind of retreating into the arms of, of anorexia, so to speak, is sometimes expressed in terms of the personification of anorexia itself. Anna, speaking of uh, anorexia nervosa in very personalized terms, Anna. So one individual expresses this, this idea the following way. 
She says that unlike other illness categories, anorexia nervosa was transformed from a clinical en entity into a friend. It became Anna, a comforter, especially during the early honeymoon phase of the disorder, as she puts it. So I think one of the takeaway uh, points here, one of the things we explore in the paper is that loneliness can in this way be a trigger for uh, anorexia, something that can drive people uh, to practice disordered eating. But at the same time, while it's important to recognize that, this disordered eating can in fact feed back into and intensify feelings of social alienation and loneliness. So for example, just think about the sheer number of everyday rituals from going out to the pub with friends, getting together for dinner at someone's house, meeting up for um, you know, dinner out. How many of our grabbing a quick bite to eat, you know, meeting for lunch? Um, I Chloe's in Denmark, and one of the one of the things I love most about uh, living in Denmark, as I did and as Lucy did as well for quite some time, is a tradition of meeting for lunch together. So if you work in an office space, Danes will uh, generally meet for about just about 30 minutes or so a day. Everyone stops working, comes out into a common space and meets for lunch. And it's wonderful. It's a, it's a really lovely kind of bonding ritual. Um, but obviously, if you are practicing disordered eating, that this, this kind of obsessive kind of focus on food-based rituals in everyday life can make it difficult to participate in social events, which generally are organized around food. And that may in turn lead to social avoidance. And again, this, is, um, this, is, this comes through in the way that individuals with anorexia often uh, regularly report feeling isolated, alone, cut off from others due to being misunderstood. Again, lots of different things have nothing to do with some sort of desire for thinness, to be very clear about this. So we find quotes like the following. People with eating disorders um, uh, are isolated surrounded by people, this person says, who don't understand what we think or feel. Recording Some of us awesome. need our eating disorders, our EDs still, and we're not ready to recover. So this kind of comforting predictability element coming through in this quote. We can't go ask for safe advice from non-EDs without a risk of being hospitalized or shunned. So this, this feeling of being isolated, cut off, kind of stigmatized or misunderstood is not something that is they're, they're making up. I mean, this is something that exists in the atmosphere, in the pervasive way of th that we tend to think about uh, uh, disordered eating. So this feeling, in other words, is supported by studies indicating that people with eating disorders consistently face stigmatization from the public. So oftentimes individuals will see somebody with uh, anorexia as responsible for their disorder. Again, this desire for thinness narrative, uh, where this practice is motivated by vanity, wanting to look thin, to be more attractive, maybe a lack of self-control or lack of self-discipline, so kind of moralizing narrative that sometimes is subtly attached to these desire for thinness uh, narratives. Or individuals will see uh, someone practicing disordered eating as looking for sympathy or attention via this manufactured condition. Again, the idea being that if this is something the individual has chosen to do, because of their lack of self-control or out of vanity, they could, they could pull themselves up by the bootstraps to show some fortitude and stop it already. Stop looking for sympathy. Stop trying to make people worry about them. And this stigma may also come from healthcare professionals, professionals who may lack the knowledge, experience, and resources to understand and help uh, individuals uh, with uh, eating disorders. And so as a result, and <clears throat> this is going to take us to, I think, what the ultimate takeaway point here of this is, the stigmatization and stereotyping of anorectic in, in individuals can result in, in uh, these individuals as feeling as though they're no longer seen as persons, but in a sense have been reduced to kind of a constellation or a manifestation of their condition. So one individual says, I wasn't allowed to associate with other people, I wasn't allowed to play sports, so there was nothing else in my life that I was good at. My only other identity was grades and my body. I was always known as the skinny one. And then another individual says that everybody around me thought that they knew more about it than I did. I felt like the loneliest person on the planet. Everyone was telling me what was wrong with me and how I should feel. So I think what these uh, quotes and, and many other quotes like them show us is that living with anorexia therefore not only transforms how one, how an individual relates to their body, but also how they form and maintain interpersonal relationships and their sen the sense of recognition or lack thereof they feel from the people, places, and spaces around them. And this persistent feeling of exclusion and non-recognition that comes out in these narratives can compel anorectics to seek out alternative spaces of connection and understanding, to find spaces where people do get them 
in other words. And so one, one place they may turn to are online spaces. So what are sometimes what are called pro-ANA communities that offer resources for developing and maintaining disordered eating practices or adopting a pro-ANA lifestyle. Now, there's a lot to say about this, and I'm since I seem to be just sort of relentlessly promoting our work uh, today, I'm just going to continue that. Uh, Lucy and I recently published a paper called Pro Anna Worlds, Affectivity and Echo Chambers Online, uh, where we talk about this uh, issue in some detail, which just kind of summarize the, the main point here, why it relates to the discussion of loneliness. The point is, that, predictably, Pro Anna sites have been the subject of intense media backlash, and intervention strategies often involve cutting off access to them. So they're often portrayed very simplistically as places where individuals go to receive tips and strategies and support and information uh, to be better, a better anorectic. Um, thin inspiration tips is sometimes how they're, they're characterized. And there is, to be very clear, an aspect to these communities that supplies this information. That's, but a fuller picture is needed. There's more that's happening, both in terms of why individuals seek out these communities and what sort of resources the communities themselves offer the individuals who seek them out. So in other words, a fuller picture ought to be sensitive to the way that these communities provide not just information or thin inspiration, but for example, support and encouragement for recovery. And then more generally, a broader sense of solidarity, belonging, and understanding when individuals feel lonely, misunderstood, and stigmatized. So in other words, these spaces, again, are not just informational resources that people go to, even predominantly for everyone, informational resources where someone goes to become a better anorectic, so to speak. These are rather spaces of recognition that help combat the loneliness that many feel in everyday life in virtue of the stigmatization or lack of connectedness and give individuals an empowered sense of agency when in fact they feel diminished agency in the face of this lack of recognition. And so in other words, the spaces of recognition, pro anna communities provide a significant sense of effective support, belonging, and comfort. And their role, this is the core argument of the paper, and this is why we think it relates to this discussion of loneliness, is that their role is not just epistemic in terms of providing useful pro anna information, it's also affective provides opportunity for affirmation, emotional connection, and sharing. And again, there's some, I think there's uh, multiple streams of evidence that support this. I'll just give you a couple of examples. One study found that messages of emotional support were the most frequent form of social support found on pro anna blogs. That's telling, I think. And we find many quotes like the following in uh, narratives of, of users who describe their motivation, the reasons for, for frequenting these spaces. I used to go to them for tips, this person says, but now I mainly go for support and giving support to others in positive ways. And members of pro anna groups also express relief at finding their true peers for the first time, as one person says. So again, just be very clear about this. And this is why it's, it's a complicated issue. We try and finesse some of the complexities in this paper. But to be clear, participation in such communities can, in fact, help drive and sustain one's commitment to maintaining practices of disordered eating and help solidify one's identity as an anorectic person. So this comes through in the way that members, for example, often share expressions of support, enter into group fast to help motivate individuals to maintain their commitment to the anorectic lifestyle. These are often closed groups. You have to provide evidence that you are, in fact, a practicing anorectic before you're allowed to enter them. So the point is just rather that these, the connection between loneliness and anorexia is complex. It can prompt the start of or kind of return to disordered eating for reasons that we talked about before, but also attempts to find community and support can sometimes involve online spaces that both scaffold disordered eating and cement one's identity as an anorectic. And the takeaway here we suggest is that intervention strategies need to be sensitive to these complexities and the role that loneliness plays within uh, the, the more general complex experience of anorexia. Okay, so I realize time is going on. Uh, I've been talking for a bit. Uh, have a little bit I'm going to say about autism and then my one slide of final hand wavy thoughts and then, then we'll talk about it, see what you th think and have to say. Okay, so what about autism? Well, first let me just start with a caveat that we flag in the paper. So in light of uh, neurodiversity advocacy, we have significant reservations about speaking of autism using pathologizing language or the language of autism as a disorder, social impairment, that sort of thing. And so I wanted to flag that. Uh, in the paper, our usage kind of you know, grouping autism with depression, anorexia, tracks historic categorizations and definitions that, while problematic, can nevertheless help us see how loneliness has been overlooked in relation to other 
so-called psychopathology. So that's why we're grouping autism this way. But I wanted to flag that we have this, this significant reservation about this. And so that's something we talk a bit about in the paper. Okay, having acknowledged that, let me now just say that loneliness uh, has been significantly underexplored within the current uh, autism literature. I think there are probably a couple of reasons for this. Uh, early descriptions, as many people know, stress the powerful desire for aloneness, this kind of drive to solitude, a kind of solipsistic drive that autistic individuals uh, purportedly exhibit. And this comes through in all sorts of subtle and even not so subtle ways today. So we still find language like uh, uh, autistic individuals or people have an empathy deficit. They lack an awareness of others and, uh, or an interest in others, They're utterly disinterested in the social world. And I think loneliness, again, insofar as it's acknowledged in this literature, is often folded into more general discussions of so-called social impairments in, uh, in autism. But this is problematic, we argue, for a number of reasons. First, it simply is the case, and it should be obvious, that you know, autistic people do, of course, experience loneliness throughout their lives. And they do so often more intensely and frequently than do non-autistic peers. They experience the same range and, and forms of loneliness that uh, many of us do, and obviously with some new dimensions as well uh, that uh, perhaps are unique uh, to autistic ways of being in the world. And many, and this comes through in the narrative of, of autistic individuals, many are long for social connection and are acutely aware of how pathways for connecting remain out of reach. So autistic individuals routinely describe feeling cut off from others in ways, uh, from ways to connect with others who may in fact understand their experience and share their values and expectations, be sympathetic to autistic styles of being in the world. In other words, they routinely talk about, even if they don't use this language, a lack of recognition and possibilities for reciprocity, which in turn brings about a sense of diminished agency. So here's a couple just of representative quotes that once we actually go listen to what autistic individuals say, we find them talking very openly about this. I feel lonely a lot of the time because I always feel like I am uh, on the outside looking in. Loneliness for me looks like I am in the world, but can't interact with it, almost like being a ghost, one individual says. Another individual reports that I got to a stage where I was so used to being mistaken by others, misinterpreted, misunderstood, I thought, well, sod it. You're going to misunderstand me. I'm not, even, I'm not going to even going to. I just closed off later in my life. I just thought, sod it. And then just another quote, uh, I cannot talk about my experience uh, of life to most people because they wouldn't understand or be interested. That makes me feel, as the saying goes, lonely in a room full of people, and I'm fed up with it. Now, some of these uh, social difficulties, these challenge, challenges that autistic individuals face may involve various perceptual deficits. So difficulties perceiving the expressive style, for example, qualitative gestures, facial and emotional expressions, actions, just various social information that's conveyed through bodily expressions that both convey, provide social cues, and guide interactions. So there are some really interesting studies, cited one of them here by Rashad and colleagues that the Rashawn colleagues that look at uh, differences in perceptual styles, what autistic individuals are attuned to, see or don't see, in the way that individuals express emotions through facial expressions, gestures, bodily movements, etc. So if they're not attuned to certain social cues via facial expressions, uh, in certain social contexts, they might uh, find negotiating these contexts challenging. Some of these social difficulties may involve a mismatch of communicative expectations. So things like uh, uh, a mismatch in terms of the timing, the norm-governed timing, the character, the context-appropriate content of communi uh, communication exchanges. So for example, an autistic person might take a long time to respond to questions or verbal prompts. A, a from a neurotypical perspective, a long time. So take longer to respond and engage the neurotypicals might expect, which might compel them to then leave the conversation, kind of close down possibilities for interacting with the autistic person. Autistic individuals, as is widely known, often withhold oh. eye contact. It's acceptable. Right, I've done everything that I can do. Yeah. In uh, autistic communities. And whereas neurotypicals uh, uh, may find that uh, disconcerting. Uh, autistic people may punctuate conversations with delays and long silences that provide direct and unfiltered responses to questions. Like, Do I look good in this shirt? No, you don't. When in fact, that wasn't what the person was looking for with that question. The point is that this, um, there are all sorts of ways why various kind of expectations and structures in terms of face-to-face -face embodied action may not, be, may not be set up in ways to accommodate autistic styles of engaging, expressing emotions and socially interacting with others. 
But one of the things we try to bring out in the paper is that this feeling of non-recognition and diminished agency may flow not just from expectations about face-to-face -face interaction, but it may flow from broader structural issues. In other words, there's a sense in which non-recognition isn't something that's just encoded in nonverbal bodily ways of interacting. Non-recognition can be encoded within the built environment. It can be materialized. In other words, the non-inclusive structure and character of many everyday spaces that we take for granted is not set up to accommodate the distinctive sensory motor needs and values of autistic bodies. And this lack of recognition that's encoded within the material environment may ultimately close down possibilities for emotional connection and reciprocity. So let me just give you one example. This is the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to stop uh, with my conclusion. So this material um, uh, recognition might be felt, for example, when autistic individuals are asked to negotiate everyday spaces that are not set up to accommodate their distinctive sensor process, uh, sensor motor needs. So spaces that are chaotic, noisy, crowdy, crowded, uh, smelly, overwhelming, spaces that negatively impact an individual's auditory and visual hypersensitivity. Think about going to a noisy restaurant or even just like a brightly lit uh, open uh, lecture hall. Uh, Sophie Bolton uh, had done some fantastic work um, on this. Uh, she has a great article called Material Encounters, a Phenomenological Account of Social Interaction and Autism. And she looks at the various ways that the built environment is, can be set up in ways that is not accommodating or inclusive of autistic styles of being in the world, uh, sensory motor processing needs. There's a sense in which non-recognition, once again, is built into the structure of certain environments insofar as these environments are set up to accommodate and uh, certain kinds of bodies and their needs and values, but not others. So here's a representative quote of an individual ex expressing his experience of becoming just overwhelmed uh, in some of these non-inclusive spaces. This individual says, I still become visually overloaded. If I could get away with going around blindfolded, there are times that that would have been easier than being distracted by a bunch of visual clutter. And another individual describes kind of being auditorily overwhelmed. It's like a constant blanket of sound of going to a restaurant or even a market that keeps coming at you until you're totally disoriented. Again, the space is set up in a way that encodes a kind of non-recognition that certain kinds of bodies with distinct needs are not welcome within those spaces. So let me uh, kind of wrap all this up. Uh, this is my final slide. So what have we tried to argue? What are we trying to argue in, in this paper? We, we argue that loneliness ultimately comes in many degrees and textures, but it seems ultimately to flow from experiences of absence, uh, non-recognition, which in turn lead to a sense of diminished agency. And one of the things I've tried to, a, a, a kind of glimpse I've tried to give you of how we uh, argue uh, this is that it has a distinctive profile. Loneliness has a distinctive profile within different forms of psychopathology and thus deserves more focused attention. We need to pay more attention to the diversity of the way that loneliness develops as an articulated within different forms of psychopathology. And we, su we suggest uh, that exploring loneliness in psychopathology will likely reveal yet more ways in which it can be experienced in relation to various disorders and conditions, and which may in turn suggest additional pathways for treatment and intervention. But I think spelling out how so is the topic for another time. So I think I'm going to stop right there. Thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Joel. And uh, we'll give you a, a virtual round of applause. Um, so uh, that's a, that one of the worst things about meeting online is that uh, applause doesn't work very well. But uh, it's uh, a, a definitely applause for me and, and, and the audience as well, I'm sure. Um, so once you stop sharing your screen now so that we can yes. come back into the room and oops, that would be um oops there we go how did that go did that work great yes perfect uh, um and what i'll do is um i'll i'll chair the discussion um now so uh, i'll keep monitoring my screen and if you have a question or a point to make um then if you turn your video on and wave your hand or put your hand up using the Zoom um, hand up uh, feature, or you can write it in the chat and I'll monitor that too. So three options. Um, and I can see Anthony is uh, waving away. So uh, Anthony, would you like to uh, open? Yes, I'd be very honored, although I'm very old. Can you hear me? We can. Great. So in 1984, encouraged by the King of England, I published a book called Safe Space. And these things come and go. 
And the core thesis, I'll keep this brief, the core thesis of the book is that humans only survive well if they can create safe spaces between one and the other where they feel trust, engage in selfhood, and a degree of permitted agreed intimacy. And so I derived this from my work at Guy's Hospital as a consultant psychiatrist, discovering that when my patients went home, as we called them then, they often got a lot worse because they lived in horrifying environments, they were threatened, it was violent, and nobody was close to them, and they were lonely. So may I say, not that I've been there before you, because philosophy moves step by step, and builds on other people's ideas. But I'm thrilled to what I've heard. Long may you flourish. And may we yet in this digital age, and look how digital we are now, try and promote the idea to other humans that they need real people who they can smell, touch, dance with, argue with, and feel known. End of my chat. Fantastic, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Anthony, you might be interested in this, but the the term safe safe space, or at least safer space, is uh, is increasingly used in. Uh, um, I mean, I know it from the the club scene. So, nightlife, where um, parties and club spaces um, make efforts to create spaces where people can come together and meet that um, allow for some of the. Uh, perhaps um, marginalized or less accommodated um, people to uh, to have their their needs met whether those are social sensory and different safety needs um, so it's a term that that I think a lot of young people are very uh, increasingly familiar with so I don't know if uh, you would take credit for coining the term but uh... I do I do the BBC <laughs> interviewed me and the first use of the term safe space is by me at a conference which was meant to be attended by the king and he had other business. He was then Prince of Wales. And I coined the term safe space. As far as we know, I'm the first person ever to have used it. There we go. Well, that, that's on the record now. Um, so Enjoy your clubs. <laughs> and your, I hope you go to lots of T-shirt parties, but that's another word. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks for that. I don't know if uh, Joel or Lucy, or, um, I think Thomas uh, had to leave, but uh, if you want no, to respond. Tom, to was, Tom was naughty. He had another social commitment tonight. And so he gave us advance warning. He might have to leave. No, I, I just want to very briefly say that I do. I would love to hear if Lucy has something to contribute to this. Uh, first, thank you, Anthony. I So I have, I'm embarrassed to admit I didn't know this book. I now have a copy, a used copy, since that seems to be the only one available sitting in my Amazon uh, sorry, I'm, I think I'm going to use Amazon uh, my checkout here. So I will soon own a copy of that and uh, consume it. So thank you for sharing this. Please I did not send know me that. some feedback. If and you can. I'm, I'm really excited to read it. No, thank you for that. And I just as a way of maybe inviting Lucy into this conversation. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm putting Lucy on the spot, but I'm going to talk slowly and long enough that she's a chance to get ready if she's interested in coming in. What you said, Anthony, about online spaces. So I agree very much that we need to maintain this kind of visceral embodied connection with others. But I think one of the things that came out in the work that Lucy and I have done, and my interest in this has really been motivated by, by her specialization, she's the expert on this, is the way that there are very rich sorts of embodied connection that are possible in online spaces as well, which might seem initially a bit paradoxical. So maybe that's where, I don't know if Lucy, if you have something to come in and if you want to respond to Anthony's comment on that point, please, please do. Um, well, first, I want to say, Anthony, I'm also really looking forward to reading your book. So thanks for the recommendation. Um, and I guess uh, maybe just on riffing on the theme of safe spaces, um, I guess this links a little bit to some of the stuff that Joel was talking about is uh, where my interest is in sort of uh, discussions about online togetherness, online connection and online community is precisely recognizing that, you know, the material world is not a neutral space. And while I am, you know, very, very much, you know, 
pro face to face conversations. I think that sometimes there is a risk that the people who end up writing about, oh, well, we can't possibly go online and give up the face to face are people who are typically more comfortable and more and better served uh, by the material and social environments that uh, typically dominate their everyday lives. Um, and so I think safe space is a particularly nice way of thinking about it, because I think it helps us understand that what safety is, is going to really depend on who you are, what your needs are and how they're being met or maybe more critically not met uh, in certain spaces. And, you know, that that that's um, nothing necessary about either online or offline space, but rather, uh, you know, relate, hopefully, to contingent historical, social and structural factors that might change. But once we, you know, acknowledge precisely, as you say, the fact that safety is going to be relational and and differ that uh the the conversations about the merits or the dismerits of online spaces are also going to shift depending on who you're talking about um i, I hope that's sort of some hint in the direction that i'm interested in uh, but i i remain optimistic that those are contingent things and aren't necessarily uh, specific features that online or offline spaces must come equipped with. It just might be that at this moment in time, certain online or offline spaces might better support some people rather than others. I just want to briefly say, if I can as well, um, I want to draw attention to uh, the work of uh, another colleague, David Ekdahl. So David is currently a postdoc here at Exeter uh, from, uh, from Denmark. Uh, there's PhD on esports and virtual embodiments online. And he's doing a wonderful project looking at the experience of online space and communities in autistic communities. So why, you know, what, what is it about the structure and the affordances of various online spaces that in some way it seemed to make them for some individuals, some autistic people, more accommodating, that seemed to present more possibilities for recognition and reciprocity. So he's investigating these and looking also at cases where maybe that, that isn't the case. So looking at the complexities of online space. Uh, and inhabiting online space in autistic communities. So I wanted to flag his work as well. He's doing some fantastic stuff. David Ekdahl is his name. Well, I'm just here promoting everyone at Exeter evidently tonight. Hey, thanks for this response. Should we take another question or point? Um, I can see uh, Quint Quinton's got his hand up. Uh, hi, Joel, really interesting talk. Thanks very much for that. Um, I just wondered actually whether some of the notions of, um, of of Goffman and the presentation of self in everyday life might be interesting and informative here. Uh, that is to say, I'm interested in the extent to which the sense of loneliness may also vary as a function of social role and location and context, so that there might be certain situations in which you might implicitly expect to have a certain quality of connection with others, which when not present or not reciprocated or satisfied, sort of motivates a very keen sense of loneliness. But actually in many other situations in our life, we have no prior expectation of a particular degree of intimacy or social closeness or reciprocity in the here and now. And indeed, were it to be present, it would be regarded as out of place or inappropriate or a type of intrusion. Um, so, it, uh, uh, and so uh, I thought of the example you gave of the person being invited to the party, um, where they might actually have had a reasonable expectation that others would have made a bit of an effort to include them because they'd started a new job, for example. Um, but actually, also thought more broadly about actually the you did mention alienation actually amongst other concepts but i'm also interested in the uh, sort of experiences of more perhaps more radical social exclusion and the quality of loneliness there so for example it, it's not the only example you could think of lots of examples but you might think of say the experience of migrants uh, coming into a society where they don't have an in uh, to in lots of everyday sort of context and settings and may also for many people just be regarded as rather marginal 
um, and not really involved and possibly have, have a very low stage ascribed to them, or perhaps not. But there's, so there's, the, in, in this complicated globalized world that we inhabit, uh, not just through the internet, but actually with people moving from one country to another and inhabiting different sort of cultural and social enclaves, there is that whole enormous source of perceived mismatch between oneself and the host society, the majority society, majority of context. So I think that's a sort of very profound source of loneliness, although the term that I'd be tempted to use actually would be alienation. Although in actual fact, I think, I mean, that's another interesting question, actually, what are the synonyms of loneliness? Can I, can I invite you to say a bit about how more how you understand that relationship between alienation and loneliness? If you would make a distinction between the two, if you think perhaps they're they're closer to one another than I suggested, because that's, that's everything you said I agree with and you put it beautifully. But I'd be curious to hear you riff a little more, if I if you don't mind, on how yeah. you understand this relationship between alienation and loneliness. It's a great question that I really hadn't thought about before. So. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, of course, you know, alienation's uh, a very involved topic in its own right with a with a with, with a mature history um, within different disciplines, um, you know, Hegel and Marx and so on. Um, but the way that I'm tending to uh, think about it is as a way perhaps of capturing quite a, 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 a well, of course, one has to, ends up using metaphors, but uh, quite a quite a marked, perhaps radical, sense of exclusion uh, from either a particular context or indeed the general context, the general context of life, the general context of civilization. Um, and, and just to sort of shift gear slightly, but I think it's relevant and interesting. It's another dimension to this because you've been talking about psychopathology, but one might also talk about political radicalization and terrorism. The experience of, of why it is that people uh, um, can uh, transition uh, into radical uh, mindsets and the circumstances under which that can happen. Um, and one can talk about sort of right wing trajectories or indeed, you know, there's a big focus on Islamic terrorism you know, 10 or 15 years ago and how, why, how people moved into that. But actually, I, I, I think the discourse has broadened to recognize actually all sorts of problems of people um, transitioning into uh, very aggrieved mentalities with respect to the host uh, society and finding ideological and social enclaves to support that and articulate a sense of grievance and so on. Um, so I think the, so uh, there's interesting writing about um, uh, Syed uh, Qutb, who was one of the ideologues who was influential in the formation of um, Al-Qaeda, um, who as a student, I believe, uh, lived in the United States, but was profoundly alienated from the society and, and wrote about that experience and about the mismatch between his sense of himself and how things ought to be as an observant Muslim and the, and the society in which he found himself. Uh, and, and I think that is an enormous and important reservoir of, uh, of, of alienation, but actually, which will often be felt actually perhaps acutely, phenomenologically as loneliness. But I think loneliness can it, it can mature and evolve into a larger sense of separation uh, from society as a whole. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add other than yes. That was, that was an extraordinarily helpful and illuminating comment. So thank you. And I, um, I, I, Lucy, please jump in if you have anything you want to say in response to that. Um, other than I, I just will kind of reaffirm again uh, that I, I encourage uh, certainly you, Quentin, but others interested in political registers of loneliness and its connection with alienation to investigate Sarah's article, where she touches on some of these themes as well. So this kind of bringing this political register into, it, I think, is a deeply important and intensely important dimension to this and maybe a way of kind of thinking about the relationship between loneliness and alienation, which you've articulated so beautifully. But Lucy, did you have anything you wanted to respond to in that? I need to say thank you. That's uh, really helpful. I, I would be, I, I'd agree with you and be inclined to, like, I wouldn't want to collapse those two terms together. 
Um, but I think that there would be lots of rich work for exploring where they do it oversex, maybe perhaps even inter more interestingly, where they where they don't oversex either. Um, and I think it's likely to relate to interesting ways in which um, you can occupy lots of different social worlds. You can feel alienated from the country that you live in and have, you know, rich friends in your alienate, you know, in the community that is being alienated alienated and I think that would be um, a very rich way of thinking about the textures of how these both do and don't go together. Fantastic. Um, so we think, I think Marcus um, you've had your hand up a little while are you ready to make your point? Okay. Yes I'm here thank you very much for giving me the stage. Thank you as well um, for Kruger for kind of giving the talk it was really enjoyable to listen to. I'm a child psychiatrist and I do a bit of research on this Japanese phenomenon called the hikikomori actually, which to basically explain it very briefly, it's a Japanese word and it describes social isolation, which is of course different to what we are talking about. So definitionally it's different social isolation, the physical experience of not being a part of people, which is correlated, but not the exact same thing as the qualitative experience of loneliness. That being said, I think people in the hikikomori literature, people recognize the fact that, so you are talking about people who di meet full diagnostic criteria for hikikomori have not had any social contact for six months or more. So obviously questions of loneliness and what this does to people's mental state and all the rest of it do factor into it. One of the interesting things I wanted to kind of reflect on, especially hearing Dr. Fry's comment on safe spaces is actually, so one of the terms that talk that they talk a lot about in hikikomori is this concept of the ibashio. Again, that's a Japanese word and it reflects basically basho is place and e represents this idea of being there. And it's quite poetic. I'm not Japanese, but I find it really poetic because it's contrasted with the other idea of, of Japanese in which it refers to something in an inanimate object being there. But this is refers specifically to animated animate objects being there and is used typically, I guess, in Dr. Fry's context to describe safe spaces, but also people where literally they can find their sense of belonging, their sense of purpose, and has been touted as one of the ways in which society more generally can help these otherwise very socially withdrawn people out of their shells and engage into community more generally. And I suppose it leads a bit into my question about hikikomori. So I, I'd be interested to hear your, your perspective on, I guess, on a public health note, what, you know, the community people can do for lonely people, right? like socially isolated people. And yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying from the perspective, you know, specifically for autism, when you've got a target for intervention, obviously you design your interventions around that. But again, to kind of bring it out into the hikikomori, the blame has been pointed for why people withdraw on loads of things. People say things like, oh, it's a changing labor market in Japan that has caused the economic bubble to burst, has made people, you know, decide, you know, they don't want to run the rat race and therefore not want to engage in society. People have pointed the blame on things like culture saying, oh, there's a really unique Japanese cultural thing about staying with your parents that have made people, you know, more acceptable to these lifestyles. And I guess more generally, I, I, yeah, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, like, yeah, from a public health perspective, is, is, is there anything that could be done, particularly with things like loneliness? And yeah, Paul Fosler also talks a lot about the online environment, which I hear, but I guess also hearing your thoughts on, you know, should more and more be done, like more generally to help, you know, not just the mental health patients, but people more generally to help make the world more inclusive, more welcoming. Gosh, that's just a small question. How do we make the world more inclusive and more welcome? <laughs> yeah. Well, let me give you my three-point program for doing that. So yeah, that's an amazing question. And I, I wish I had a good answer to that. I think I, I would be curious. I'm sorry to do that annoying philosopher thing and turn the question back on you, but this is not me evading the question. This this obviously really is the important question. What is the practical you know, significance of this sort of work? Uh, and I guess I have a couple of things I can riff in a second, but I'd be curious just, you know, if I can ask you, since you were, you're actually working with, I guess, uh, children in this context or young adults, do you, is there some sort of pattern or some sort of 
if you, you've observed individuals who do find ways to reconnect with the social world, who maybe kind of leave this very solitary lifestyle and do find a way to re-engage with the social world and others, is there something that often acts as a prompt or some sort of nudge that makes them more comfortable doing so? Something that you've observed that maybe is, is typical or present in a lot of different cases? Assuming you have instances of people you're working with who do find a way of reintegrating with the social world. It's a good question. I think the difficulty I stand as a consultant psychiatrist is that I think these kinds of cases are very chronic. Mm -hmm. Again, as I said, the time scale of more than six oh. months. And oftentimes people have struggled with difficulties for all their lives until I see them and I expected to solve everything in one appointment, which of course you can't. But I think in part it also means like, and I hear very much and I empathize with what you're saying in terms of the fact that you know, I think they need social connection, people to belong, places to feel safe. And I think once that kind of thing ticks, it is, it's great. And I'm also drawn to research when, 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 you know, people say things like, you know, what makes people resilient? You know, people have had awful, awful, you know, life experiences and all the rest of it. But as long as they've had one person, one stable factor in that sense, you know, nice, you know, grandmother, great teacher or this kinds of things, as long as there's one person in which they can weather the storm with, it drastically improves prognosis. I can't remember a reference for that, but yeah, I think that's generally where the things go. And I suppose as a clinician, it's helping them find that, if I can. That's No, that's really helpful, I guess. Actually, Anthony, did you want to jump in here? Sorry. Oh, now I'm I taking over moderating that. duties, evidently. You're the boss, man. I'm just the, an accessory. Uh, Joel, can I say something? Yes, please, Lucy. Sorry, I just wanted to quickly follow up, Marcus. Um, I, that was a really fantastic uh, question. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm really interested about the description about relationships with objects, because that actually linked a little bit to what I like how I wanted to respond, uh, which is that, I mean, this is not going to solve loneliness overnight. But I think that uh, one of the key things to talk about is the stigma of loneliness, because I think one of the like uh, the the problem with loneliness in many ways is that we are all afraid of loneliness and the problem that uh, a, a, about where that kind of fear is sourced from is connection when it's going well is two ways. So I think an inherent fear that we have of lonely people is there's a sense in which it is contagious because if certain people are struggling to find connection with you, then you are also going to struggle to find connection with them. And I think that there is a very real sense in which the experience of loneliness can feel like it is catching in that scenario. Um, and so while talking about and destigmatizing loneliness isn't going to cure it overnight, I think at least facing up to the fact that many people have a very deep fear of lonely people and steer clear and have these very stigmatized ideas that often then get translated into ways in which it is the lonely person fault is really endemic in uh, how I think we try and defend ourselves against our own loneliness. And I think that feeds into a lot of uh, uh, why it is such a, a difficult topic both to talk about, but also for people to actually act in kind ways in relation to. Sorry, well, Anthony. No, I think Lucy put it beautifully. Just very quickly. Oh, good, yes. The doctors love to prod philosophers. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I exist, can't be rewritten as I smell and I become close. Biology set us up long before words and philosophy were invented to get close to other people. I'm not going to give a lecture, but try this. Oxytocin, underarm sweat, Jacobson's organ in the nose, which tells a man what's going on with female eggs. Female eggs tell a woman that norethisterone in male sweat is desirable when they're about to drop an egg. When women are about to drop eggs, they bear more flesh. There is wonderful nightclub studies in Germany. The biology of closeness and trioxytocin as well is riveting. And it sits side by side with digital contact. I'm just going to prod you all as philosophers, as a doctor who adores philosophy um, and, and a consultant psychiatrist and a fellow of the Royal College. I'm just throwing that out. It's another whole session. But the biology of closeness, particularly oxytocin, 
and the human pheromone yet to be discovered is riveting. Over to you. Great. Uh, thanks. That maybe um, I know Clayton's had you've had your hand up. Um, would you like to jump in here? Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been really great to hear some philosophy after all the neuroscience. Um, so <laughs> I'm just uh, gonna really add, and this might be part of the presentation that uh, you omitted through depression or not talking about depression, um, but I think there's, it's undeniable that technology plays a huge impact in all of these things, but I think uh, it could be mined in uh, a couple more ways in understanding it. Um, especially with within the realms of the um, things like Instagram, or uh, I guess the new one is Be Real. Uh, I might have some, I'm now showing my age at 32, but uh, there are so many ways in which people uh, create community. And there are ways in which that's beneficial of showing that, oh, this is what we're doing. But then it also has another backlash for those who aren't a part of it. Um, and I think within the digital age, we have this expectation that everyone is reachable all of the time, which is an unreal expectation because no one truly ever is. But then on top of that, you can layer in the aspects where somebody might have reached out to an individual and then they never heard back. But then on the other aspect, they see what that person is doing. So they're not only being excluded, but then they have the next layer and level of understanding the exclusion, um, which can be understandable if somebody goes to speak about it, but that's another layer of social maturity that most people, especially at a young age, don't have. And then on top of that, layering the understanding that not everyone is reachable all the time, which is confounded by well, if you are opening up your Instagram to take a photo, that means you've seen or passed by the digital receipt of text message or message on XYZ that also wasn't. And so I think there's a lot of layers to this aspect where you are not only, someone might not only be excluded, but then they are made aware of the exclusion, which then drives even further the aspect of loneliness in ways that 50 years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, wasn't available. Because if, if somebody did something that you were trying to meet up with them, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have known until the next time. But now people are even further isolated uh, to the point where they don't want to create outreaches, which then compounds over time. Uh, I could keep going with layers and layers and layers, but I think it's still a, another aspect to this that could be explored. This is right in Lucy's wheelhouse, so I'm going to give her first crack at a response. But this is, yeah, great point. Thank you, Clayton. Are you very pleased that our next uh, collective paper is uh, Spaces of Loneliness and Intimacy Online? So <laughs> I'm glad that feels like that's the right direction to go in. Um, thank you so much, Clayton. Uh, so uh, you've actually brought up a lot of the questions that we're really uh, excited in sort of driving this project forward into is looking specifically about how design and etiquette across different social platforms uh, online uh, might foster experiences of intimacy, intimacy and loneliness. Um, uh, so with, I, well, I, uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of Joel, but I probably can. Uh, I'm specifically interested in the way that um, the narratives about this also need to be very platform specific because the design of these platforms are going to be very, very nuanced in terms of our social expectations, the different sort of social etiquette that uh, is already arising, um, our sense of expectation out of different spaces. Um, and I think there's something really interesting where um, we both massively over and underestimate the complexity of the etiquette that we have online. I think there is both more etiquette um, than sometimes is acknowledged. And then other times I think that actually uh, what often happens is we take all our uh, sort of offline social etiquette and expectations and just assume that it's going to neatly transfer online. And actually we need to have much more open discussions about how we socialize. You know, most of us spend an awful lot of our 
childhood learning the rules of social etiquette and then it feels sometimes like we're all thrown to the wolves in terms of like muddling our way through on different platforms um, and we don't really talk about kind of the social development of social skills on different platforms and how that how they need to be platform specific and things like this um and also the you know how how one performs and what one does on different platforms may be more or less appropriate uh, for fostering intimacy and loneliness. Um, so that's that's not really a concrete answer uh, to your question, but uh, is an acknowledgement that there's an awful lot of questions uh, uh, to be raised in that area, and that's kind of the direction that we're hoping to start exploring some of these things. So at least initially, what I want to do is uh, do, a, do a comparison of the design of say an instant messaging platform such as WhatsApp or Signal and compare that to a social media platform such as Twitter and Instagram. Um, and think about how the very design structures, the audiences you're talking to uh, may uh, be better or worse set up uh, in terms of uh, promoting or exacerbating loneliness and intimacy. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that that also parlays with that is the, uh, as Dr. Fry was saying, you know, the the ability to be intimate with people in a moment and to see things like body language, even this is limiting our body language, right? Uh, the way we set our camera, the availability of lighting, whatever it might be, changes that dynamic. And then um, whether or not uh, tone or intonation is brought into into the scope or seeing someone's bubbles come up and then go down and all of those really play into how people can interpret it mm -hmm. uh, and then even on a, a receiver's end whether or not these timing comes into play or the social exhaustion all, all of those mm -hmm. layers on the sender and the receiver uh, change the way the message is uh, portrayed and then mm -hmm. uh, experienced, and then on top of it can exacerbate or reduce loneliness. Great, and also like the creativity and textuality of our platform use, right? Like I'm sure that many people in this room have been both occupying a public forum while also potentially texting other people who are actually in this room and creating spaces of intimacy even while occupying a place of public space um which is also you know notably something that we do in face-to-face -face meetings you know I'm very warrant like I'll own up to texting lots of people in conferences that I'm sitting next to who I'm not meant to be talking out loud to so I think there's also a lot of interesting questions about the way we creatively work around some of these complex Complexities and even potential inhibitions or in, um, uh, in interesting ways. And I think we're, we're still finding different ways to do that. And that's, that's also very exciting and interesting, I think. I can confirm Lucy's behavior. My Apple Watch was buzzing away off screen as she and Tom were chattering with one another the whole time I was speaking. It's just criticizing Joe. <laughs> what's up, what's up, making fun of my style and my, my jumper and things. So yes, yeah, so I can confirm she <laughs> Um, that's right. Um, I'm just aware of the time. So, um, uh, Quint, I know there's a couple of people with their hands up. It's been such an interesting discussion, but can, can we go to Jethro? Well, thanks a lot for the talk. It's a really interesting topic to think about. Um, I was I was interested that you were talking about loneliness as being something related to absence of objects around us. But I wondered also whether you could characterize it as a kind of presence in some way in that we're thrown back on ourselves uh, and our individuality and our own personhood almost in a kind of existential way. And we're forced to kind of create meaning and agency without other people there. And that when, um, when in our kind of, as the last question has raised, you know, we're in this digital age and we're surrounded by all those people all the time. We're connected all the time. We have phones with us, everything with us all the time. But when we do experience ourselves, we experience our own individuality, it's an unfamiliar, almost a kind of alien-like experience unto ourselves. Uh, and so that's kind of like us re-experiencing our own presence in a way. And so the the, the, the kind of shadow side of all the, the the opposite of 
of absence in a way. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. So well, that's great, thank you. Um, Lucy, did you have any thoughts on that that you wanted to start with? Uh, that was really beautifully put. And I think uh, um, uh, I was reading someone's work the other day who was talking about like the incongruencies and tensions uh, that are in, are, at least their argument was that there's an inherent in loneliness. Um, uh, this is uh, another philosopher called Valeria Motta, um, who, who's an expert on loneliness. And I think that you really nicely captured that is that sometimes what's so excuse me putting this way goddamn awful about being lonely is how very present you are as your own self and that you can get extremely bored and frustrated with your own personal presence because it is so glaringly you know um salient to you and I think that was a it made me think of Valeria's work she didn't use that example but I think that was another nice way that uh, often uh, learning the, the experience of loneliness comes up in these contrasts so you know feeling lonely in a, in a busy space feeling d despair while in a beautiful place and feeling the the absence of others while the very like heavy presence of oneself uh, and maybe some nice ways to think about that so I, I just thought that was a really lovely way of capturing Valeria's way of putting it as well. And I think Tom would agree that the work Tom has done on absences has tried to stress the, the, the experience of uh, presence in absence. And so the absence is something that is experientially present in our experience. I think grief is a very salient and powerful example of this when we're grieving the loss of someone. Um, you know, and Thomas Fuchs has some nice ruminations on this. We often feel their absence in our lives as a kind of persistent presence. So we go to a cafe we used to frequent, a favorite restaurant, a club. We come home at night and see the contour of the recliner still shaped to fit their body that no longer resides there. All of these things are very tangible presence, uh, reminders of their absence. They're very, again, experientially present to us. And I think loneliness, as we want to characterize it, has that quality as well. And I think I hadn't really thought about it quite the way you put it beautifully in the sense of throwing us back on ourselves and our agency and making us confront our agency and maybe kind of have a kind of renewed, I guess, awareness of the extent to which we often do rely upon the collaborative agency of others when moving through the world and doing things. And when that suddenly isn't just absent, but felt to be inaccessible in a deep abiding way, that is going to leave us, you know, to confront ourselves in a way we're not accustomed to. And so I really like that way of putting it. Uh, that was beautiful. So yes, so it's a long way of saying thank you for that. That was great. And uh, I think on that note, unfortunately, we're, we've run out of time. Um, it's such a dynamic discussion, but I, I thank you so much, uh, Joel and Lucy, um, for, for sharing your, your work with us and, uh, and uh, uh, taking part in that discussion. Uh, uh, so, much, so many uh, interesting and, and beautiful insights. So uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. And, uh, Thank you, thank you for the great questions and for coming, everybody. Really, yeah. Appreciate. Thank you so much, and thank you, Chloe, for chairing and yes. uh, and for Emily for organising us. Really, really enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you.